My name is Scott Johnson. I've been with Worldwide for about eight years. I've done data center stuff for about 30 now. Um, primarily my background is in servers and storage. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the fundamentals of Flash and some of the things as a potential Flash customer that you might want to consider. Um, the first question I always want to know is why you really care about what today's topic is. Um, so Flash is uh, a, an interesting change in the data center architecture and the way it works um, from the traditional arrays that you've seen from a hard drive perspective. The biggest reason people like to talk about Flash is the speed and the performance that it brings to you. So what you're going to see now is, I swear, will be the longest 10 seconds of your life. But this is why we care about Flash. So that's what it does for your data center. So. That's why they named it Flash. And that, that is truly the longest 10 seconds of your life, I imagine, you just saw. Um, the big thing I wanted to talk to you about was really, from a serious point of view, is why people want to talk about flash storage. And you can see the four big topics up here are the performance, the cost of storage, the facilities, and the, uh, the ability to accelerate decision making within your organization. So from a performance point of view, flash is just essentially going to be much more faster than your, H your hard drives are going to be. So that allows you to um, answer questions more quickly, um, do processing more quickly, and generally um, uh, get to a business outcome that you're looking for much more quickly. Um, it can also affect your storage costs um, because primarily um, your flash drives are going to take a lot less power to run than, than a hard drive. So if you look at the cost of running a 15K hard drive versus a 7.2K hard drive, um, that cost for power is going to be double. So if you increase the speed to try to get more performance, you're going to uh, increase the cost by 50%. So that's a, another reason flash is not mechanical. Um, it's strictly solid state device, so there's no moving parts and no inertia to overcome. Um, it can save you space in the sense that the ability to get IOs generally from in the old school storage days is defined by um, how many spindles you have answering the question. So when you have a database and you need to get more quick responses, you're going to add more spindles to that. So you're not so much worried about capacity, but the amount of IOs per spindle you get, um, you can do that with a much smaller flash drive. So if you don't need storage space, but you need storage speed, Flash is a, a good way to do that. And then the direct business application is that it accelerates um, the decision-making process. So if you can get things done more quickly by using Flash, it allows you to move forward in your business. So that's it. The big reason people use Flash is it makes applica applications execute faster. So that's the biggest reason people consider Flash. The ability to save electricity and space and so forth in your data center secondary. The primary driver is flash, for Flash is its speed. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about where Flash came from and how we, we've ended up using it. Um, this is essentially the first commercially available hard drive. So this is what was an IBM Model 305. Um, yeah, actually, that was the first thing I, I, uh, um, I cut my teeth on. And then this is actually the, uh, the first IT manager I worked for. Um, it was very portable, easy to move. You just had to have a forklift. Um, and you could put it on a plane and take it wherever you needed to, to, to fly. Um, and this is not even state of the art anymore. So if you consider the bulk and the weight and the storage space, which we'll talk about in a second of this device, so this is a two gig micro SD card, right? So it's about the size of your uh, thumbnail or your uh, little pinky nail. So you can see the change in, uh, so what, 30 years, 60 years, whatever, 56, you got five megs, cost you $120,000. A two gig micro SD card is five bucks. You get 400 times more storage and it's 24,000 times cheaper. And now there's, I just saw um, SanDisk, they've got, a 200 gig micro SD card coming out now. So that's how fast the technology has changed and how much more efficient it's become. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about an overview in storage and probably for most folks here, this is really simple and it's, it's redundant for you. But I just wanna make sure we set some common ground here. Essentially, if you, uh, if you look at a server on the top, there's essentially, there are two ways to present storage to it. One is block-based storage and one is file-based storage. And so file-based storage traditionally is going to be NFS or SIFS, SMB. If you want block-based storage, you're going to basically either have a network you can attach to or you will directly attach that to the server. So you can have storage that's inside the server itself or you can directly attach array 
typically by a SAS cable or something like that now. Um, from a storage area network point of view, three main protocols we talk about are fiber channel, FCOE, and iSCSI. And you may see flash in the server itself in, in some formats. Um, most likely, generally, when we think about flash, we think about an array that consists of some flash or all flash. And that can be presented typically by either um, the, the file-based or the block-based approach. But those are sort of the ways you want to fit storage into a category when you're thinking about it. And this is an example of the two types of systems that you'll see. Flash is going to look like, uh, uh, like a, a, an SSD. I mean, it's going to look like an SSD. It is an SSD. But it's going to appear similar um, to, to the carrier that you'd see in a hard drive now. Um, and interestingly, um, when you talk about the performance of a hard drive, what you're going to see here is hard to see. The disk is rotating at an extremely high speed. Uh, this is a 10K drive. And you can see the head, actually. So the reads and writes, when you do a query, the head actually moves back and forth across that platter. Platter's spinning at an extremely high rate of speed, which is why it's hard to see. But those two characteristics make up what sort of limits the performance of, an, of a hard drive now. So when you do a query or you do a write, the hard drive has to rotate, so there's some rotational delay there. And then it also has to do a head seek. So depending on where the head was, um, it's going to have to traverse across that cylinder, essentially that platter, to get to where the data is. And so that mechanical system has inertia, and that's why it takes a lot of power, and that's why um, they aren't as fast as solid state devices are. In a little bit of history, so this was, starts out about 1995, actually 1994. Um, you can see on the left column, you can see all the guys that made hard drives. And on the far right, you can see who's left now that makes hard drives. So there's been a huge amount of consolidation in the market. So there really isn't a lot of variability in the hard drive that you get in its performance. If you look back in the 90s, there was a lot of differentiation in the hard drive manufacturer because the firmware that runs in those drives, um, their secret sauce was designed to make the drive perform more fast. So there was a lot of stuff about how they queued the, the commands and, and ordered data. So that as that drive, as the head moved back and forth, you got a, um, a better performance. It would optimize the queries. So they would line the queries up so as the head moved across the platter, you would get the data that you needed. So there was a lot of engineering mumbo jumbo secret sauce. And, and people differentiated their drives on how well those algorithms worked. And that's all gone now. They're all really good. They all do it about the same. And there's only three guys left that you can do that from. Flash is sort of the same way. But Flash, the market has only existed for about five years. So it's really in the phase of the left side. So we'll talk about some of the things that Flash guys have to do to overcome the limitations, just like the hard drive guys did 20 years ago. And that's where a lot of differentiation and a lot of uh, variations occur in the performance of Flash devices. It's the firmware in the Flash translation layer that uh, affects that. Um, really what it is, it's a unicorn for every problem that you've got in your data center. So if you have problems, buy a unicorn. Um, actually what it is, it's, um, uh, is there anybody who studied electrical engineering in here besides John? No double E's? Okay. Um, it's this, <laughs> this is what Flash really is. Um, and it's a special what's called a MOSFET. So it's a transistor essentially. And the reason that Flash is different is it's a special kind of transistor, and I think this works now. Um, if you look at the top, there's a control gate, and then the second thing down there is the floating gate. And in a normal transistor, you don't have that floating gate piece present. That's a neutral, and you can see it's not really connected. It's, it's insulated on both sides. So it's, it's sort of a neutral, non-connected piece of uh, media, you can think of it as, inside the transistor. And that's where the charges get written or are not present. So when people look at flash, the floating gate is where the bit is on or off. That's where it actually happens. And it's important because that design, what happens is uh, when people talk to you about the life of a flash device, it's got so many reads and writes. And so every time you write to the device, it wears, it ages. That's what's happening is you're blowing electrons across those two uh, sides. And that lattice that connects all that stuff basically breaks down when you hit it with enough energy. So that's why you can only write X amount of times to a flash device. Um, so just in, in a more kind of uh, a thorough way to, to explain it to you, it uses electricity and has no mechanical parts. We've talked about that. So it doesn't have the mechanical inertia of a 
rotation delay or a seek time delay that you need to account for when you're looking at a regular hard drive. Um, uses much less power because, again, it doesn't have that mass that it's got to drive at a consistent RPM all the time. So it uses a lot less power. And again, it's digital, so it's much faster. Um, if you're concerned about, in some cases, in some data centers, you guys may be already in the position where uh, I've actually seen, I think in NASA, they had a sign like, no more stuff in the data center because we don't have any power. It's like they literally do not have enough power uh, to add anything else to the data center. So if you're, you're facing a performance problem, you know, typically the way you're going to do that is you're going to put a bigger array in, a faster array, more disk, more spindles, you're going to get more throughput. Um, if your data center has no power to spare, you can't do that. That's not an option. So that's one reason why, why flash is looked at. Again, it, it also just generally consumes less power for you. Um, and so specifically, depending on the application that you're running, it makes it more sense to put flash in because if I'm a credit card company, for example, and I want to do real-time fraud detection, having the ability to do that really, really quickly while you're in the middle of the transaction and I can verify that that's a, an appropriate transaction, it's going to save us a lot of money on the back end in terms of fraud prevention, that sort of stuff. So that's another big use for, for flash. Um, <clears throat> the other thing important to note is, and we'll, I'll show you a picture of this in a minute, but it is essentially, you should think of a flash drive, uh, an SSD, as it's essentially a little mini computer. So it's inside your computer, uh, inside the server, but it really does have all the components that you need in a, in a, com in a, in a computer. And that becomes important, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and so it can be an SSD that you see in your laptop. It can be uh, the little SD compact flash. It comes in a variety of different formats. Typically in the data center, though, we think of it primarily in two fashions. One is um, as a, an SSD, uh, a PCIe device that you're going to put in your server, like, uh, for example, Fusion. I don't know if you guys have heard of Fusion. Or it's going to be an SSD that's going to be placed into an array that's going to connect um, into your storage network, uh, be that IP, you know, depending on what you want to present, file or, or block-based storage to your systems. And so this is what it looks like. If you pop open kind of the SSD that's in your laptop or an SSD that goes in an array, it's going to roughly look like this. It's going to consist of a bunch of NAND flash memory. It's going to be sit sitting on a you know, uh, printed circuit board. And it's going to have a SATA interface. And it's got a controller. And the controller is just like the hard drives where they had uh, their firmware that did all the magic that made their uh, command queuing and so forth better, uh, more competitive product. In the controller, that's where guys differentiate the ability of their flash systems to do things better, faster, more efficiently, have longer lives, and those types of things. Um, there are also things that they can do outside of the controller. So um, depending on who your OEM is, they will have approaches to minimize the amount of wear that goes on on that drive. So the drive itself has some brains that are different, depending on who makes that firmware in the controller. Um, and then it's going to have an interface that plugs into you know, either a PCI port or in this case, a SATA, interf a SATA interface on your, um, uh, in your system. Um, something that's coming that's, that's sort of new, it's out, is, is an ultra dim. So just like this uh, would fit into a SATA interface in your system. You can have a PCI card, like a, a Fusion I.O. card. Uh, the next kind of most highly performant, least latency, is going to be this uh, dim. And so these things actually can fit into the memory uh, slots that you would normally put your standard memory DIMMs in, but it's, it's PCI uh, or an SSD type device. The reason it's important is as you go from sort of the fastest data retention um, area in your computer is going to be registers that are on the CPU. So they're going to have, the CPU will access those registers probably in nanoseconds. Really small, really, really expensive. Um, then you're going to have some cache on your CPU that's also really, really fast, probably in the nanosecond range. Um, again, really small, really expensive. Then you're going to start to get to memory. Um, you might have a cache, depending on the design, that's off CPU. But um, you're going to get to memory in your computer, and that's going to be really fast. This is almost that fast. It goes in the same spots, in the same bus, with the same bandwidth. Uh, so that's why this is starting to become pretty popular. Um, the only systems I know of right now you can buy this for are IBM's, so that's kind of off our list right now because IBM sold their server business to Lenovo. Uh, and then right now you can get it in um, Supermicros right now. So, but other OEMs are looking at it because, again, in the battle, the race for speed, this is sort of the closest thing I can get to with the highest speed, lowest latency bus in my system. 
So if I'm really, really concerned about speed, right now the generic approach is, okay, I'll buy Fusion IO or something of that nature on a PCIe bus. This is even faster than that. So it's something you want to be aware of. Um, it's not a widely available product yet, but it's sort of coming and it's going to become more ubiquitous. In this case, this one is made by um, SanDisk, actually. Um, SanDisk, and so if you go in, uh, SanDisk has a program they call Guardian Technology, which is essentially, there are three phases to it or three parts to it, and it does exactly what I talked to you about. It's like their secret sauce to make sure that they do what's called wear leveling. So when you've got all these cells and you're going to write data to it, you want to try as much as you can to not write to the same cell time and time again. So if I've got this huge room full of cells to write to, I want to make sure that I write to every cell once and then I start over again. Keeping track of that um, has a lot of overhead. So the way they do that is their secret sauce. That's their cleverness. How do I manage and track the number of writes that I've made to a cell and mix that up? And there are a lot of different engineering ways that they solve that problem. And that's what their secret sauce is. So in these things, in their specific cases, there are little, I think there are controllers on it. Um, they're going to do that to, at some level on the, on the storage device, the solid state device. But also, for example, um, an OEM will do things like at the storage level, they're going to do deduplication or they're going to do um, compression to try to minimize the amount of data that goes in there. Um, sometimes they're going to need from a management point of view to rewrite that data. So their solution that the OEM takes, just like the firmware SSD device manufacturer takes, is going to make a difference. So, and all those things interact and they all play together, sometimes better than, than others. So um, the, the firmware, the flash translation layer, stuff that occurs on there plays a role, but also the the way Fusion manages it, or the way NetApp, or EMC, or whoever the person may be, the way they approach solving that problem as well to minimize the rights has an effect on it. The other thing people will do is on a device like that is they'll typically um, over-provision the device. And so when you buy, you know, uh, 256 gig SSD, there's actually going to be a lot more, not a lot, but probably a quarter to a third more RAM on it, uh, or, or uh, cells to write to. So they'll under-promise on what that holds because it allows them space to make sure that they meet the requirements for write life. And what they'll do is they kind of won't tell you that they're using the extra space that they've got in the device, but they'll use that to move writes to and so forth. And there are other things that go on called garbage collection, and we'll talk about why when you use an SSD, um, the performance initially can be really, really good out of the box, but over time it'll degrade. And we'll go into a little bit about why that's the case and why you need to test for that. Um, this is just some generic specs from a generic SSD. So if you get kind of state of the, not even state of the art, kind of a, like a last year's model, you're going to see IOPS that are, you know, pretty high. Uh, relative to a really good um, SS, SSD, relative to a really good hard drive, you would probably see 250 IOPS, generally speaking, depending on if it's uh, a 15K drive, a 10K drive, if it's a SAS drive or a SATA drive. If it's a big SATA drive, it's going to be much less than that. It'll be less than 100 IOs per drive. So the reason this is important is if I got a database and I need, I need 20,000 IOs to run my database based on the amount of traffic and queries and writes I get, then it's a math problem. So you buy a fast drive, you buy, divide my IOs by 100 or 150, that's how many drives I need. So typically, in that kind of environment, you don't need the capacity, you need the IOs. So all applications, when you need IOs, the old school solution is you just buy more spindles. So every spindle I add, I get another 100 IOs. And I just keep going, and that's why you get these monolithic, huge data centers with all these drives in there. It's not because you need the space, typically. It's because you need the IOs to get the performance that you need out of your application. So this is just gives you an idea of why, you know, what, what you get with an SSD and why people are interested in them. Um, this kind of shows you that in a, in a graphic sense. So you can see at the top, you can see what the read speeds are. Then you can see that the write speeds are a little bit slower, but not much. But the latency is extremely low. And that's much better um, than you're going to see in a, a regular hard drive. Hard drive, like if you look at hard drive specs, you're going to see between rotational delay and the seek delay, eh, like 1.5 to maybe 3 milliseconds, depending on what's going on. So that's a, it's hugely faster from a latency point of view. Um, and this just gives you an example of a web server. So you can see, if I've got a web server and I run it with an HH, uh, a regular hard drive and an SSD, you can see the performance variance there. 
So it makes a big difference. And so if you're trying to satisfy customers and keep them on your website or answer a question or support somebody who's doing something, it makes a big difference for you. Um, and this just gives you an example of the write speeds. So sort of a good SSD is an Intel X25, and you can see how fast it can write randomly. And if you go to kind of the best, fastest hard drive, which is down on the bottom, it's the Western Digital Velociraptor, you can just see the huge variance there. So the thing on top is really, really fast, really, really light, and doesn't suck any power, essentially, from your point of view. The thing on the bottom is pretty heavy, sucks down power because it's fast, it's a 15K drive, and it's going to give you, you know, essentially, you know, almost at half an order of magnitude, a lot less from a performance point of view. So that's why Flash is interesting again. Um, if you're easily distracted by shiny objects, you probably need to get out of your job and become an account manager. Um, so go sell something to somebody. Sorry, Matt, I didn't really mean this. Sorry about that. Um, that's for our guys internally. Um, but when we talked about, the, I talked sort of about the three ways you can connect uh, a flash device into your system. So the first way people did it was with SATA interfaces. And so that runs into an IO hub in your server. Um, if you asked anybody who builds flash devices now, would you use a SATA interface to connect your flash to your system? They would all say, no, we wouldn't do that. They did it, though, because it worked. So um, it's kind of relative to the three ways to connect. It's a, relatively speaking, a low bandwidth kind of high latency connection. But it made it really easy to basically put a little device in the solid state drive that said, hey, I'm just like a normal hard drive. When you see me, you see a hard drive. And I can do the things that you need to do. So the SCSI 3 commands that go into that thing get translated into what it needs to do. So it's easy to get it out. The next step is like Fusion I.O. and those types of things. So they're actually plugged into the bus, so they go a little bit faster. They don't have to go through the controller. Uh, and then the third fastest way now, the, the fastest way, is with uh, the, the ultra dims. Uh, X-Flash is uh, the, the name IBM markets them under, just so you know. So it's the same thing. So it's a much higher bandwidth, much lower latency device. Um, if you use a hard drive, you're going to see latencies, like I said, about like one to two, three milliseconds. Um, on the, uh, the PCIe devices, you're going to see a latency that's about 75 microseconds, probably, something like that. So much, much faster than a, a regular SATA drive. Um, if you see the, the DIMMs are going to run like uh, basically five microseconds or less, those ultra DIMMs. So it's a huge jump in capacity and speed. Um, the trade-off you need to think about in your mind is just this, that um, if, I, if I go one way, I get a lot of capacity. If I go the other way, I get a lot of latency. So if I look at what RAM gives you in an SSD and HHDs, the cost per gigabyte is really low for a regular hard drive. But the cost for RAM is going to be extremely high. So if you price out server, server RAM, you're going to see the cost variance here. It's really big. On the other hand, if I'm concerned about latency, then maybe the cost for RAM or an SSD or an ultra dim or something like that makes sense. Um, but if uh, I'm not concerned about latency, then a hard drive makes sense for me because it's going to be a much slower, higher latency device. Um, and so if you look at what's running on your system, it'll look different, but roughly you're going to see the, uh, the application is going to be broken up into sort of three things that it's doing. One is it's waiting for the application to actually do work. It's waiting for some system overhead to occur. Most of the time it's going to be waiting for I.O. So the CPUs now, I mean, are just crazy fast, crazy powerful. Most of the time, the CPUs in your system, and you can look at it, uh, even if you're virtualized, they're mostly just cooling their heels, waiting for the disk subsystem to get data to them. And that's what you're trying to fix with a, a solid state device. And that's why um, the I.O. weight is a, is a part of that total processing time that you can shrink down by putting an SSDs in. So what you want to try to do is build a balanced system. You don't want to have too much CPU because it's just wasted money. It's capacity that you'll never be able to feed with data to get the performance that you want. Um, on the other hand, if you went crazy with a very slow CPU and put SSDs in there, you're going to have these SSDs that are really fast, but you're not going to get the full, full use of your CPU. I mean, uh, a correction, you're not going to get the full use out of your SSDs and the data throughput you've got because the C CPU will be too slow. So that's kind of a, a trade-off there. You want to kind of be in the middle where you've got good, powerful CPUs and good this subsystem to feed that with the data that it needs. Um, so you've heard about SLC and MLC. An SLC is single level uh, uh, SSD. So basically within that SSD in a certain cell it's either on or off. Um, you now have got the ability to have more than 
um, one bit in an SSD. So a single cell can be two bits, and now there are also three bit ones out. Um, this complicates things because the the way the SSD determines its state, whether it's a, I'm looking at a zero or a one, becomes less clear when I add more bits to that cell. Um, so if you're a comms guy, it sort of makes sense um, in the sense that it's harder to determine the signal from the noise because the differentiation between those states is closer, so it's harder to be so precise. And so one thing that that shows up in is the write life of the uh, device, the SSD that you're looking at. So if I have a single level cell, you can typically write to that cell about 100,000 times with no monkey business from wear leveling and moving stuff around and, and so forth. If I got an MLC device, I'll probably get, and those are typically oriented on consumers, um, they're more dense because you get twice as much data per surface area of the uh, SSD, but they're going to only last, the write capability will last for maybe one to 10,000 times versus 100,000 on an SLC. So when you do your pricing, you'll see, if I buy an enterprise class SLC SSD, it's a little bit faster, but its write life is much, much longer. So the name of the game from a manufacturing point of view is, how do I take more dense, which means more cheap because I get twice as much data on the SSD, and use two, um, two bits in that cell, how do I keep that um, reliable and have a life that's equivalent to what a regular hard drive life is? And so that's where a lot of the engineering goes into, how to make that appear that that's the case. This just gives you a little bit of information on how uh, things work. So if it's single level, you can see that the, the reads are a little bit different. The erase time is about the same. Um, programming it takes a little bit longer. When you actually erase uh, the SSD, it actually writes all ones into all those cells. That's how the thing is erased. Um, and then the, the thing that's kind of interesting is down here, if you look at when you want to do an overwrite, um, you know, a regular hard drive, you're just going to write that data to the sector that needs to be written to. But if you're in an SSD, you've got to write it to a different page. If you're out of space, you've got to actually erase this whole block. You just can't erase a cell. And, and I'll go into that a little bit more detail here for you. But um, it's one of those things that really changes the way SSDs behave. So if you're not aware of that, you buy your SSDs, you put them in, and they're blazing fast. And then as you start to use up that capacity, over time, the performance is going to degrade. And when you have to start deleting things to write over that space again, so the space is free, your operating system thinks it can write on it, within that little controller on the SSD, it's got to figure out how do I erase what stuff I can erase. I've got to move stuff, and then I've, I've got to do a whole block, and then I can start to write. So a write can take a really, really long time. Like, you'll know, like, it'll be very frustrating when you do that on an SSD if it's full. Hence, they, over they, they give you overcapacity and they do these tricks to try to make it um, not as painful for you. But, and, that's, and that's where all the differentiation in the engineering goes. So this is a great slide for you double E's, but um, essentially what they do is to figure out if a cell is a zero or a one, they put a voltage across it. And if it's you know, in the middle, if they get a voltage out of it, if it's erased, they're not. If they do, it's a, it's a thing. And uh, there's a better slide here that shows you this. So this is a page, if you look at the top, the top three guys across the left and the right, you know, there's a one in the top left, there's a one, and there's a zero. And on NAND, what they do is they, there's, a, uh, there's a line on the top of the, of the cells and the bottom of the cells. And they're going to put a voltage across it. So it's just how a basic transistor works. And then what happens is, if you look vertically, so what we want to know is what's the state of the top three boxes. So that's part of the page that I want to read to see what the status of those three cells are. So then what they're going to do is they're going to put a voltage across those guys vertically, and then they're going to see what happens, what comes out when they put that voltage across. So on the one on the far left up here, that's a zero, and it doesn't conduct that voltage, so they know that that is a zero. The other ones um, all conduct, so the voltage comes through across those cells, so they know that that's going to be a one. And that's how it's telling what the state of that bit is. And they do this, this is for single uh, level. They do the same thing for um, uh, two bits in, in a cell. They just do it again. And the differentiation between what's a positive voltage and not, how much voltage gets through, changes. And so it's a little more finely grained, so they've got to be able to detect that. And then when they do three bits per cell, it gets even more flaky. So if you do signal processing and that kind of stuff, when you look at how many bits I get per baud, and you know, 
if you don't really do any encoding, you're gonna get one bit per baud, so it's really, really slow. If you do like, you know, QAM or something where you've got all these states that those bits can be in, it gets much harder to determine what the bit is. And that's what happens with SSDs. So this is the way it's organized. So you're gonna have a page and that's what you're gonna read from and write to. And that page is gonna be a part of a block. And then the block is gonna be part of the plane. And then when I need to do something to it, like I need to write something, what happens is if the block is, has space available, it's a new SSD, so I'm not in this trick of having filled up my SSD yet, then I'm just gonna write my changes to the block and it's just like a normal drive, it works fine. Now I've only got one free page left in the second one over here on the bottom, but I've got two pages to write, so I'm out of space. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna do some garbage collection, is typically the name of it. They're gonna copy the stuff that they can to a new location, hence the over-provisioning. Then they're gonna write ones to all those cells, and then they're gonna copy the stuff back. So that process of copying the data, uh, moving it to another location, writing a voltage across that block, uh, and then writing the stuff that they need to back out, typically out of where it was, is what takes so much time. And so that's why when you fill up an SSD, it gets really, really slow, because it's not as simple as just writing a change to a location like it is in a hard drive. You might have to go through you know, some fairly serious uh, gyrations there in the SSD. And that's what causes a delay sometimes. And that's why you'll see over time a performance decrease in the SSDs. So kind of to get away from the, the, the down in the, the, the weeds kind of stuff. So when you think about an SSD, they read and write data much faster. Their IOs are much faster. So they get many, many more IOs in comparison to a regular hard drive. Uh, they've got higher throughput. They're physically more robust because there isn't a part to fail. Like you've always heard about it, like a head crash on a regular hard drive and things like that. So if that little head hits the drive, it's really bad news. Um, the dis disadvantages are though, they're, they have typically less capacity than a hard drive. Um, the cost per gigabyte, if you're worried about capacity, is gonna be higher. They have a limited number of write cycles and a lot of engineering, like we've talked about, goes into minimizing that effect of every time I write to a cell, I'm breaking down that lattice and I'm gonna eventually destroy the SSD. And so they spent a lot of time figuring out how to mitigate that. The performance degrades over time, it gets filled up and you gotta go through that whole procedure that I talked about. And you've gotta manage the lifespan. And that's where all these guys spend a lot of money and time and engineering cleverness to try to make sure that the writes are minimized. If I minimize the writes, the SSD will last as long as it can. That's the game. Where you can find it. So you can find it in the server, like um, Ultra Dims that we talked about, Fusion IO, you can find hybrid arrays that are a mix of SSDs and regular hard drives. And so what they'll try to do is they'll have some sort of a queuing scheme to try to make sure that the data that needs to have low latency, high IOs, will be located on the SSDs. You can have distrib distributed server storage stacks. So like um, Nutanix would be a good example of that where they'll take the storage that's in all your servers, kind of make that one virtual array and allow you to use that the way you would like to. You can have all flash arrays. Um, the way I think of those is an all flash array would be like a traditional array, but you've just pulled all the S correction, all the hard drives out and made it SSDs. Um, and then sort of the newer flash arrays are designed to support flash essentially. So if you take, uh, sort of like taking kind of an old car and putting like a new tires or a new engine in it, it may not really be engineered to take advantage of all the horsepower that you're gonna get out of it. Um, so you really need to buy like a new design. And that's where uh, typically all the all, all the folks are, like NetApp, for example, has arrays that are built from the ground up to do all flash. Um, EMC has them. Um, I think probably Hitachi does, but there are big guys who are really building systems that are designed to take advantage of the uh, performance advantages you can get from an SSD, but also to overcome the, some of the deficiencies that you get. And if you just stuff a bunch of SSDs in, a, in an array that was designed for, solid st or for hard drives, you'll get a lot of the benefits, but not all of them. But there are good reasons to do that. Um, and if you look at what a flash array gives you, um, and we've done this for many customers, uh, MasterCard Worldwide has, we've done this for Starbucks, for example. When you look at performance, performance is one of the things you wanna consider when you buy a flash array. But you also wanna consider the services that you're used to in a data center. So if you need replication or um, you wanna do like snapshotting and, and all the services that you expect an array to do, you need to make sure that those services to the degree that you need them are present in the array you're thinking about. 
So if raw speed is all you're after in, in IOs, then there may be a box that's right for you. But if you want a box that's uh, pretty fast, it gets flash, but I need it to do replication or deduplication or compression or whatever, then you might not buy the fastest box. You want to buy a box that provides the data services that you need. Um, and then you need to think about, well, what happens if I push the box really hard? Will my latency stay flat? Will it be really, really fast? Or will at some point when I hit it with so many IOs, is the performance going to drop off and my latency is going to go up? So there are a lot of things to think about um, when, when you consider an array like that. And we've done a couple of looks for different customers based on what their, their criteria were that they were interested in. Um, so things to think about, the, the NAND technology is all the same. There aren't that many companies that fab the NAND, uh, and that's the cells, the memory chips. The differentiation occurs to some degree in that controller. So that's where um, the sort of the, the mumbo jumbo on the, uh, the flash, the SSD, takes place. And that's where there's a lot of differentiation. Um, the hybrids, I think, are going to be around for a while, and again, you know, this is, this is sort of my opinion, so free advice is worth what you pay for it, right? So take this with a grain of salt. I, if I knew, I, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you. I mean, this is my best guess of what I think is going to happen. Um, but the economics of Flash uh, are going to make sure that you still have hybrid arrays, so a mix of SSDs and regular um, hard drives in there. Um, you're still going to have to address blended workloads. So if I'm going to do uh, video, say, you know, if I want to store predator feeds or something. Yeah, I'm not going to do that on a flash drive. It's just, I could technically do it, but it doesn't make sense because I won't need that from a latency point of view. So it's not a good use of that resource. Um, and, if, and if the array itself was not designed for the IOs that a flash device can present, then you're really paying for something that you're not going to get full use of. So that's another thing to think about. Um, I think if I was a, an array manufacturer, I would be concerned about the hyper-converged architectures. Um, and some of the internal shared server storage stuff. Um, and the all flash arrays now um, can sort of disrupt the traditional business model that your regular old sort of old mainstream array guys have had. So if I'm ENC or I'm NetApp, the ability of a young company to come up, uh, you know, like uh, Pure or um, uh, SolidFire or somebody, um, they are disruptive to my business. And even internally, to that company that provided you that array that you rely on every day. Internally, there may be people who have an array of their own, a flash array, that may be challenging my sales force and my um, conventional way of doing business because customers want to do things. And so there's something that I know I can maintain, I can sell. Um, it does business, it's really reliable, but maybe customers are looking at something else. So potentially, it's a very disruptive technology. And I think in the next few years, it's going to become much more so. Um, and then you just need to think about, you know, the economics, the services, the workloads, how you characterize your workload. Is it okay if it's variable, like if you're in the VoIP world, right? Do you have a lot of jitter? So is this thing really, really fast 90% of the time, but then uh, on the outside, does it take, you know, 10 seconds to answer a query? That's something you need to think about and test before you buy it. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think if you want a flash array, and you, you probably want to think about a new one, but you've got to balance that with the services that are available on the platform. Um, one of the ways to solve the right problem um, is through deduplication um, or compression or both. Most, I won't say, many people do both now on a flash array. They'll both do deduplication and they'll do um, compression. Um, and then the other limiting thing sometimes is the ability to scale out properly. Um, the future. This comes from actually a company called Skyera, and they were bought by um, HGST, which is a subsidiary of Western Digital. So again, it sort of goes back to that first slide we saw where there are basically three hard drive guys now, right? So there's no differentiation. Um, some of you guys, I think they've been used to some degree in the community, but what they do is they use really cheap um, consumer grade SSDs. They have a very complex controller and they try to make the cost of their storage um, uh, the same as, as a regular hard drive is. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm not, you know, making a comment here about who it is, just that the potential for Flash is really why I wanted to show you this to you, is that if you've got all this stuff in your data center and you can compress that stuff into a Flash uh, drive that's extremely dense and wears a long time, 
it's going to cause people to think about what they're going to do, how they're going to solve their problems. So it really changes things. The other thing to remember is the flash is all solid state. So if I have to put it in a tactical vehicle or something, bounce it around in a submarine or, or a boat or something, um, you know, there's a lot less susceptibility to a mechanical failure because it's a solid state device. Um, and courtesy of NetApp, actually, this shows you where they think potentially the costs break down. So just like I said, in, in the hard drive space, all those guys worked really hard to make their firmware different. Um, it's now all the same. Um, the flash guys are there now. They're trying to make all their firmware and, and the rights leveling and so forth. They're trying to make that better. They're all going to converge to pretty much the same functionality. It won't be a feature anymore. It'll just be kind of a required thing that's in your SSD. And so they may be, um, uh, you know, from, from kind of a NetApp point of view, they think the cost is going to continue to drop. Uh, they're going to continue to add more bits. Um, they build these, the SSD now, they can build the, the transistors in three dimensions now as well, so they get more density. Uh, so there's a lot of engineering and development going on there. Um, so it's just something to be aware of that the capacity may not be there, but the cost may, may get there. Um, and just to give you some things to think about, and you know, um, what I personally think is the storage world is going to be a lot more dynamic than it has been. It has been dynamic. It's going to continue to be really dynamic. So if you look at the size, um, when I did these, you know, so EMC had a, a fairly big market cap. NetApp was not as big. Cisco is more than twice the size of both of those guys. Um, EMC bought this company called DSSD that's supposedly really, really fast, but no one knows much about it. Cisco bought Whiptail. Um, what I think you're going to see is just like the mini computers back in the 80s and 90s, that the storage companies are going to be forced to deal with increasing competition and decreasing margins. So from a customer perspective, that's great news. But it's going to affect the relationship that you have with them and what they can provide to you. So you need to be aware of that. It's a very dynamic um, space. Um, I, would not, I couldn't even guess how many startups are in that space now. People who are using Flash or part of Flash in a converged or hyper-converged market. You know, for example, Nutanix is outside there. Um, it's going to be a really you know, depending on your point of view, exciting, scary, dicey kind of thing that, that's going to come along. Um, if you are thinking about SSDs, you really need to talk to uh, somebody, whether that's worldwide or, or someone else, but you need to evaluate what are the criteria that are important to you as a user. Is, the, is low latency the thing for me? Is throughput the thing? Is, um, uh, you know, the services that the array provides to me, are those more important to me than the speed and so forth? Those are things you need to think about and, and talk to somebody to check. Um, other challenge that these guys have, um, you know, there's, there's object storage now, there's all flash arrays, you know, I mean, you can read this list. There's a lot of different ways to do storage now that are different from the traditional, here's an array and here's what you get when you do it. Um, it's disruptive. The flash market really has only been around for about five years now, so it's still really developing. A lot of players in the market, a lot of different approaches on how to solve the right um, problem that, that we talked about. Um, that affects the performance of your applications. From our perspective, it, it complicates our relationships because there are so many different companies now that have a solution that, that they, I mean, and if you talk to any of these OEMs, you know, they'll tell you and they tell us. Um, I mean, they honestly think that they're doing the best thing they can for the customers. So from a reseller's point of view, we're trying to give you guys the best thing that solves your, your problems, your needs. And it, it complicates our life, too, because just like you have to do market research and understand the products, we have to do the same thing. And so then we have to test this stuff and try to make sure it's going to meet your needs. So it, it complicates your life, but it also complicates our life a lot. And the current products are very differentiated. So when you look at the traditional metrics, like um, if I'm in a data center, I really care about having two arrays and what the failover is if my controller fails. So how long that takes for those controllers to talk to each other and get your data back available. Um, there's a huge spread right now in the flash arrays that we've tested between how long that takes. So if you want to run a 24-7 always up application with great performance um, and you cannot afford to have your I.O. halted for several seconds, that's going to have a big impact on whether or not you buy an all flash array or which all flash array you buy. So that's a really important question to ask. Those are the kinds of things you need to think about. Um, if I just need to have a really great experience from my VDI users, but they can afford to not have I.O. for five or six seconds at some point in the day, then that's a different story. So you need to think about the use cases. Um, again, this is really kind of wrapping it up here. 
So execution speed is the reason. So you get in, you can do more transactions per second, you get lower latencies. Everybody can do more in the same amount of time, so you don't have to buy more staff. Um, if you're providing service to somebody, you can avoid an SLA penalty. So if it says, I'm gonna get you so much data in so much time, um, you can do that. Um, if you're running an application, you've got an SLA, and you've run out of essentially bandwidth, you've run out of IOs, and you've got an old traditional array, there's only one way to solve that. That's get a bigger array with more spindles in it. So this is a way to not do that. Um, and then if you're doing decision support, big data, high performance computing, you can answer those questions that you're trying to answer more quickly. Um, you know, same thing, use cases essentially we've talked about. Um, and I think these are it. So this is kind of the thing that I think of because it's pictures. But if I'm doing VDI, I want to think about Flash. If I'm doing server virtualization, I want to think about Flash. And if I'm doing database or analytics, so that would be traditional SQL, um, high performance computing, or even some of the big data Hadoop-ish type things that you guys might be thinking about. The I.O. makes a big difference in the performance of the application, and it's something that you need to at least consider. Uh, in most cases now, um, pretty much everybody thinks about Flash now when they're looking at additional storage for whatever reason. Um, this is just some additional information if you're curious about it. And if you just want uh, uh, you know, drop me an email or something, I can, I'll send you the presentation. It's no big deal. You don't have to try to write that stuff down. And that should be it. <laughs>